Guys, welcome to another Longevity Wisdom Pod. We have Gennady Stolyarov with us. He is chairman at the Transhumanist Party, the U.S. Transhumanist Party, that is. He's quite the interesting character. I've been reading about him, uh, listening to some of his YouTube video. He's also member, board of director at uh, LEV. I interviewed Aubrey de Grey last week. That was amazing. We're going to have a nice conversation about the future about Gennady's mind. Um, and yeah, let's start with a quick intro uh, before we get deep into it. Gennady, can you introduce yourself and tell us a bit more about the U.S. Transhumanist Party? Certainly. And thank you, Charles, for having me as a guest on your podcast. I am a philosopher, author, and futurist. I'm also an actuary, but primarily uh, for the purposes of this conversation, I am a transhumanist. I am someone who wants to use science and technology to overcome the historic limitations of the human condition and usher in the next great era of our civilization. I have been the chairman of the United States Transhumanist Party since November of 2016, and the aim of the Transhumanist Party is to put science, health, and technology at the forefront of American politics so that we could hopefully use emerging technologies to overcome the greatest current problems in our society and to inaugurate an era where life is going to be better than it has ever been for as many people as possible. So it seems like a tough problem when U.S. is spending trillions in military. Like, why are, are they doing that? Why are, is your strategy so different from most uh, parties that have been on in, in power so far? I mean, all of them had some kind of a military strategy. And nowadays, we're seeing with inflation and all that, it's creating, it's going to create pretty much mayhem. So they, they invest in military while they could just fix the economy. I think it's kind of a, it's not a sinking boat, obvi obviously, but it, it will hurt a lot of people. So what, why is your strategy so different and how would you orchestrate it? And certainly I agree with you that the massive amounts of military spending right now within the U.S. federal budget, especially, but also within the budgets of other countries would serve to the detriment of human flourishing and well-being because these are resources, of course, that could be devoted toward more productive purposes, toward building rather than destroying. In terms of why there is this immense amount of military spending, I think this stems from the evolved flaws in human psychology. Humans evolved during a time of great material scarcity, where essentially these small hunter-gatherer tribes had to really fight for every scrap that they would get. And they would have to fight other tribes, they would have to fight wild animals, and this zero-sum mentality evolved within the human psyche to the point where a lot of people still today implicitly think that in order for one person or one group of people to win, another person or another group would have to lose. And this zero-sum mentality finds no more prominent expression than in the constant tendency of large groups of humans to wage war against one another. So overcoming this zero-sum mentality needs to be part of this next great step forward in human evolution. And this is where the Transhumanist Party advocates a different approach. We don't believe that we need anybody to lose in order for us to win. We don't believe that in other countries there needs to be more suffering or more deprivation or some loss of economic power in order for the United States to get ahead. The United States can get ahead by continuing to be a leader in technological innovation, a leader in commerce, a leader in attracting great minds to come over here, and a leader in terms of good ideas, of proper governance, of respect for individual rights. It is the traditional American concept of a shining city on a hill that I think the United States 
ought to return to. And we don't return to that concept by waging war. We don't return to that concept by imposing ourselves militarily on the rest of the world. We return to that concept by doing the best we possibly can domestically, and then showing that as a good example for other societies to emulate voluntarily of their own free choice. And of course, technological leadership is key to that by continuing to invest in emerging technologies, we can show the rest of the world how this can be done, how living standards can be improved. And again, we don't need to bomb other countries. We don't need to support military forces in other countries. And we certainly don't need to threaten the world with nuclear annihilation, which implicitly, unfortunately, is what the U.S. is doing by maintaining a first use policy of nuclear weapons, which no other country in the world does. So instead, we need to be models for a peaceful society that advocates what Thomas Jefferson and George Washington considered to be the ideal foreign policy, which is peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations and entangling alliances with none. And transhumanism certainly fosters that because transhumanism tries to focus on what unites us as human beings. And the aspirations of transhumanism, they transcend national boundaries. They transcend ethnicity. They transcend contemporary political ideologies because transhumanism focuses on making life better for everyone. Right. Got a flurry of questions for you right there. Um, I'm, and I'm pretty sure your intellectual mind will be able to deal with all of them. Okay. Um, sure. But game theory, right? Like, what if we are nice people, but there is Putin, you know, then the next thing that came to my mind is people at the top usually are, are more rational. Um, but that's that seems to be untrue. In Putin's case, it really seems to be testosterone still, you know, like judoka type of guy, the chess player, you know, all about like me winning and you losing. Um, really uncomfortable with these types of personalities that don't have an open mind um, for the record. But it, it seems kind of tricky, you know, and yes, uh, we still somewhat live in the property age. I'm not sure when we will ever get rid of that thinking, you know, because it's just how we're wired as humans and it's it's always kind of game theory like who who will actually decide to make the first step in the right direction and show the the example to me it's kind of if we need like new chips in our in our brain new mental models because there seems to be really few other models that exist out there even if we're abundant right even if we've got limited resource what is telling you that this guy won't uh, send a missile or, or way and why not uh, have a preemptive strike on these guys, and I think uh, the the crab in the bucket uh, phenomena is is still very much um, prevalent, and I, I don't think we'll we'll get rid of it anytime soon. I can possibly see it when we colonize other planets, and we live we'll literally have physical kind of barriers. Um, but I, I have a hard time seeing how we're we're gonna get over that. Tell us how uh, transhumanist. Um, views um this all, all of what i just mentioned and the potential plan for for fixing that because if i would be president of us i don't think i'd i'd just be like uh all peaceful and stuff you know i, I would probably deploy uh, military defenses um try to foster abundance and yes have my priorities on health and and economy e economy but um there's still like evil actors out there that don't share my same philosophies and are not pro-life, right? And pro-rights. Talked with a, a Russian guy yesterday that just if he mentions uh, Russia, the, the U Ukraine war, well, he might go into prison, you know? Uh, how about that for freedom of speech? And you, you always need to deal with with these bad actors. If, even if you're the nicest guys, you you go out there in the streets, you might get robbed, you know? And me, I, I probably don't want to get robbed, so I'll just punch a guy in the face or, you know, do do what I need to do to, to get my stuff going. What do you think about all that? Well, I think there's a difference between defense and external projection of force. So the United States, of course, has a lot of advantages going for it. It does have the largest military in the world. It does have 
the best trained and the best equipped military in the world. But it also has two oceans separating it from uh, the other great powers of the world. And this is a quite effective defensive position. Nobody is going to invade the United States on its soil. And the United States military would already be in a superb position to coordinate the defense, not just of the U.S., but also, for instance, of the United States European allies. I think it's utterly unrealistic that Putin or anybody else would invade a NATO country as well. Now, Putin, as you said correctly, does have this zero-sum mentality, and he has expressed it many times. Indeed, the notion that uh, he would even invade another country and try to claim its territory uh, under whatever justification is indicative of that zero-sum mentality, because I could have thought of many other ways that the tensions between Russia and Ukraine could have been resolved in a peaceful manner that would have actually addressed concerns like uh, the treatment of ethnic Russians in Ukraine or the fear of the spread of NATO, for example, in a way that didn't involve a military invasion and didn't involve the bombing of largely civilian settlements. So Putin definitely has this zero-sum mentality, but I don't think he is insane enough to unilaterally launch a world war. And I don't think the U.S. government right now is insane enough to unilaterally launch a world war either. But the problem with this current tense situation and the idea on each side that, well, we have to firmly respond to perceived bullying or aggression from the other side is that it can create a spiral of escalation where initially nobody might intend for there to be an all-out war, but through a series of mutual suspicions and misunderstandings and misinterpretations of events that might be accidental in origin, this kind of massive escalation would nonetheless occur, and neither side would want to back down because backing down would be seen as cowardly, it would be seen as weak. And I think this is a major flaw of our evolved human psychology that we need to overcome. This fear of the perception of weakness, where a lot of people, especially males, but uh, I would say this can apply to uh, humans embedded in a society that holds these norms. But a lot of people will think that if they're in a position where they've committed themselves to some sort of stance, uh, particularly standing up for what, what they consider to be right or what they consider to be theirs or rightfully belonging to their society, they cannot back down because that would be somehow reprehensible. It would be a reflection of what in the Paleolithic era would have gotten one killed because uh, if one had the standoff with a neighboring tribe and one showed some sort of weakness, then the neighboring tribe would just invade and take one's cave and uh, steal the women of one's tribe and uh, abscond with whatever food supply uh, one's tribe had amassed. So there is this very strong evolved incentive to just stand one's ground no matter what, even if it's based on an issue or a set of objectives that are really expendable. And a good example of that is the fight right now over the city of Bakhmut in Ukraine, which is a small town, essentially, that has been under attack by Russian soldiers and the Wagner mercenaries for many months now. And the Ukrainian military has actually devoted tens of thousands of troops to defending this strategically insignificant town. So the Russian army and the Wagner mercenaries are sending wave after wave of people to essentially be killed, uh, their cannon fodder in effect, trying to take literal meters of territory. And the Ukrainian army is also 
exhausting a lot of its manpower trying to defend the small town and neither side wants to back down because it's a matter of pride. So I think if people start essentially shifting their mindsets, because right now we don't yet have the technology to really effectively re-engineer our brains. So we have to make do with essentially cognitive approaches and rational philosophy to uh, perhaps take certain steps that are counter to our evolved intuitions. But if people shift their mindsets and try to think more in a long-term, strategic, pragmatic way and say, look, does this particular thing really matter that much? Or do we have broader objectives here? And objectives would include our lives or the prosperity of our economy or the rate of our technological progress, which certainly is not helped by so many people being sent into the meat grinder, so to speak. Right. If we take that analogy to the business world, how do we solve conflicts? Um, by the way, I take the business world because we tend to be a bit more civilized, right, than, than normal humans, than the consumer world, let's say. So we have a mediator uh, most of the time. That's for a start. And usually... Yes, it's IQ, it's stats, you know, hey, Russia, you're losing X amount of resource on a daily basis, and you're putting yourself in a hole that you might not get into. But it's also EQ. Hey, Russia, like we know that you're you're proud and you want this and you'll you'll get that this is a possible future for for you, dear Russia, um, have a, a seat at the table and so forth. I think it needs to be win-win, you know, it, it's, it, we cannot win a war using the same philosophies that the guys that started it are actually using, namely win-lose. We've seen that after World War I, uh, when we tried to penalize Germany, that never worked. Uh, it's frustrated them more than anything else. You, you can't like, you need to go more with the rewards and the punishment, ironically. And then, well, what's what's dictating that is the full democracy. It's humans. It's the whole planet that's angry against Russia. And that is also in the win-lose mentality, right? Let's punish them. But that never works, which is why I tend to... Um, I tend to be a bit more technocrat than most. You know, I think that uh, experts and... People that have experience in that field, um, for example, Chris Voss, when it comes to negotiation, well, he should be part of that panel, for example. Um, and he he also goes with a win-win philosophy, by the way, when he negotiates hostages, this ex-FBI guy. Um, I, I think they should have a, a, a strong thinking and acting power and yes have a part of uh, democracy weight on the, the final decisions, but I think that's, that's how we should go. I feel you and I could talk... Um, for forever about these things that I, I definitely need to rehab you on the podcast, but um, let, let's keep it to, to one last question that uh, made me curious. Um, you decided to go with the political route. Um, why not go the um, uh, social startup route, for example, and, and try to, do, do you feel you, you'd have a higher impact and, and uh, increase the rate of the adoption of uh, transhumanism by actually starting a business and, and doing that, or do you feel that politics was the right uh, path to go forward to maximize your impact? Well, in terms of the choice to be involved in transhumanist politics versus some sort of business activity, I looked essentially at what field was more saturated. And there are a lot of startups in the transhumanist space, both in terms of biotechnology and in terms of, for instance, artificial intelligence, one could even say a company like SpaceX is a transhumanist type of organization, even though Elon Musk might not call himself a transhumanist. Nonetheless, some of the results of his actions definitely contribute to that kind of future. However, in terms of politics, we don't see a lot of transhumanist rhetoric. We still hear a lot of zero sum uh, types of thinking from conventional politicians. And we have a political system that I think is ripe for innovation, and yet has a lot of barriers that the major political parties have established in order to thwart that kind of innovation. So I think this is where 
a lot of the greatest marginal impact can be made also to assist the transhumanist oriented startups in getting their technologies out to market more readily, facing fewer regulatory barriers and getting more of the public to accept the advances that these startups have to offer. Also, political involvement does have the benefit of bringing in an additional audience because there are some people who might not follow the latest scientific news. They might not attend academic conferences or read books about transhumanism, but if there is a candidate for a prominent office and the transhumanist party has run a presidential candidate in every US presidential election since we were founded, then a lot of people will start paying attention or at least would be introduced to the ideas for the first time. So it really is about creating another channel by which the general public could access the ideas of transhumanism and then hopefully follow other channels as well. So once a political candidate introduces them to transhumanism, they might pick up some books, they might be interested in the work of certain startups, they might donate to some of the nonprofit organizations performing research in transhumanist related endeavors. And that would grow our movement that would shift the culture. Of course, as a small political party, in a country where the two party system is quite entrenched, we don't expect to win the presidency anytime soon, but we do expect to make a difference in terms of public understanding and public opinion and the kinds of policies, the kinds of areas of focus that other politicians would then emphasize in their rhetoric. Love it. Can you give us a bit more info as per where to find you online or find out more about the Transhumanist Party? Of course. You can find the Transhumanist Party website at transhumanist-party.org. And there we have a lot of updates about our recent activities. And you will be able to follow information about our presidential campaign, which is in progress. We're going to have our vote soon to nominate the candidate who would represent the U.S. Transhumanist Party in the 2024 election. I also have a website, The Rational Argumentator, that's rationalargumentator.com. It is my online magazine that I've published since 2002. You can also find me on YouTube. I have a YouTube channel. It's G. Stolyarov II. And then I have a Twitter account as well and a Facebook account. Of course, the U.S. Transhumanist Party has a Facebook page called U.S. Transhumanist Party, as well as a Facebook group called Transhumanist Party, which you are free to join. And also, I would invite our viewers to check out the Transhuman Club, which is the non-political affiliate of the Transhumanist Party. We have a lot of art there. We have a discussion forum. We have ways for our members to collaborate on creative projects. And that website is transhuman.club. So I encourage you to check out any or all of these resources.